Hello. Sorry about that, dude. I told I just got out of a session and I was like, oh my God, I totally, totally spaced about this. I'm glad you emailed me. Thanks for uh, willing to do this. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I was surprised that you uh, hadn't, I couldn't see an interview that you've done before. Yeah, nobody's, uh, nobody's interviewed me, so you're the first. <laughs> so I can uh, start from the beginning and ask uh, how you wanted to pursue acting in general. Yeah, so uh, I knew that I wanted to be a voice actor after I saw Lord of the Rings and the Two Towers. I saw Andy Serkis' performance as Gollum, and I just thought it was like the most incredible thing that I've ever seen. Uh, the way that somebody can give voice to a character like that and like make it so believable and real was just like really kind of inspiring for me at a young age. I don't even remember how old I was when that movie came out, but I think it was in like seventh or eighth grade. And I remember seeing it in the theater with my dad and being like, that is so cool. Like how, and like, how was a real person making that noise or that voice with their instrument? And from there, I just started learning how to do voice impressions. I would always bother my friends at school and do voice impressions and, uh, I went to undergrad, I wanted to pursue theater, and so I did a lot of stage work, and then I moved down to Dallas recently in the last four or five years, and I started to pursue voice acting kind of full-time. Was there ever any aspiration for you to move to LA initially? Yes, yes, and uh, that is still definitely like in the cards for me, I would say. I would love to move out to LA. I think there's a lot more opportunities for uh, certain kinds of genres out there. Video games is something I haven't done a ton of, and I know that there's a lot of video game work out in LA, and it just seems like uh, a really kind of like bustling community of actors out there. And, you know, I want to break into film things as well. I do commercials here and there, but I would really like the opportunity eventually to go out there and kind of see what it's all about. So how did you first get involved with uh, anime then? Right. So I knew that Funimation was in Dallas. And uh, I, had, I had a couple friends who had uh, worked with Funimation. Um, they were from my undergraduate, under, undergraduate school, my undergraduate college. And uh, they, they said, hey, like, if they don't really hire, like, outside of Dallas. This was pre-pandemic. You know, things have changed a little bit since then. But... They're like, if you move down here, you can maybe get an audition and, and uh, they'll kind of see what you're made of. And so I moved down here to pursue my master's degree in acting. I got accepted to a program at Southern Methodist University. And I, while I was in my master's program, I had time to kind of audition for Funimation. And, you know, I sent in my demo reel, as pretty much everybody does. And then you wait and you hear back or you don't hear back. And it could take months. It could take, it could be very quickly. It's it's kind of a process and it changes all the time. Um, but I heard back about six or seven months later. And I went in and I auditioned with some characters for Cliff uh, Chapin. And he was awesome. And he called me back in and I did some Walla you know, which is background voices. And uh, I did that. I went a couple months and then uh, Jade Saxton called me in for an audition for the Helpful Fox Senko-san. And I booked the lead character of Nakano, which was like huge for me at the time because I'd never, you know, prior to that, I'd only done like several Walla sessions and I wasn't quite sure like how good I was going to be at it. And from there, I've just been kind of working and auditioning for, for lots of other directors. And I've had a lot of fun working with all of them. I mean... It's very, very awesome to be able to work with all these directors at Funimation because each of them has their own kind of unique directing style. And it takes a little bit for you to get to know them and them to get to know you and like what works best for you uh, directorial wise. Mm -hmm. And I've had an amazing time over the last four years working with everybody. And it's it's with every role that you do, you know, you get better at it. You get, you learn more about the dubbing and like what is like an open mouth uh, sound like versus like a closed mouth or clenched teeth moment in anime and yeah I mean I just I auditioned they called me in and uh, I started booking small parts and then I booked the lead and it's just kind of been that since mm -hmm. and did you did you take the dubbing pretty easily or was it difficult at first at first it I think it's kind of like a learning curve for everybody right. um Whenever you start anything new, it's like, you know, you get in the booth and you're like, oh man, how do I do this? What do these beeps mean? Where am I supposed to talk? Am I 
talking too loud? Do I talk over the video? And I, I, it took me a few sessions before I kind of started to really understand what it was about. And I would say probably a little bit into Senko, I got, kind of really got a hang for what it was like to, to get in there and like do it, you know, and, um, and the scripts change and stuff. So like sometimes there are mo things that have to be uh, changed on the fly, but it's, it's a, it's a really great, great way to like stretch your skills and abilities as an actor um, and know how flexible that you can make yourself for what the director needs in the moment. And with uh, Senko, could you, uh, how could you personally relate to Nakano? Ah, <sighs> Kuroto Nakano. Well, I'm tired all the time. He is tired all the time too. And I think, you know, I wake up in the mornings and I'm like, oh, if only I had like another five hours of sleep. And I think everybody deep down w w wants to be pampered in a way. They have a sense um, that's like, you know, wouldn't it be great if, like, there was a magical 800-year-old fox demigod here to, like, rub my feet or, like, help me cook or clean? Because when you get home after a long day's work, the last thing you want to think about is doing all the dishes or taking out the trash and, like, to add even more things onto your already busy day. And I think having that kind of pampered mentality in a way made the character a lot of fun to play because like it's not something that i have you know i don't have an 800 year old fox that we got here um but it's something i think we all wish we do we did have yeah what your second lead role would have been uh an ensemble stars either that or uh the ones within i don't remember which one came first um if it was ensemble stars yeah morisawa chiaki was awesome he you know he's way more high energy than nakano so i hadn't i hadn't done a character like him quite up until that point uh but doing an idol anime I, i'm and i'm still learning you know every time i do a new session i'm like i have never done this kind of genre before or mm -hmm. this is like brand new to me and like idol anime you know is different than slice of life which is senko and like the idol anime is like you got to be really excited all the time and it's like some of those characters are like let's go uh and more Chiaki was that way and i would say he is actually more uh the kind of character that i am in real life like i get really excited about things not like as excited but I definitely have like a Morisawa Chiaki energy in me at all times. Okay. Um, yeah. And did you get to on that on that same topic? Did you get to uh, sing for Actor Song Connection? Yes. Yes. Uh, so Actor Song Connection, another idol anime. Sound Caden Studios casted me. It was the first time I'd really worked with them, and it was so much fun. I'd never done anything like in a microphone other mm. than that, and so getting cast and hearing. Uh, what I had never, I'd never listened to any Vocaloids before. I had no idea what they were. And they did a really, really good job. And Dawn Bennett, bless her, she is an incredible, incredibly patient and wonderful human being. She, uh, she voice directed us through almost all of the songs. Um, and Emily Fajardo as well. I mean, going in there and like listening to the songs, you know, we got sent sound files so that we kind of knew what the song sounded like beforehand and the lyrics beforehand. And so when we got into the studio that day, we would, we would just record those songs. And like, I learned all kinds of tips and tricks from Dawn to like have more support, um, chest support, vocal resonance, things like that. And I still use those tricks when I, when I sing an anime now. And it was a very interesting experience because having the ability to not only play a character, but like express that character through singing was huge. And like the songs are absolute bangers in that show. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they get stuck in your head and I will still to this day, uh, look at, hear those songs or like somebody will say a word that was in one of those songs or in like a particular order. And the song is just like boom there it is and i'll and i it won't get out of my head the rest of the day and do you have a personal preference for um lighter roles opposed to darker roles Ooh, so i really am very interested in like darker more villainy roles it's something that i don't get to play that I haven't really played um, other than in like bits and walla sessions but having the characters that are more like explosive or like have really very specific feelings about 
about what their point of view on something is is always a lot of fun. I, 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 I get cast a lot as the light characters, which is great. I enjoy those as well. But I love moments, even in those shows, where, like, the character, like, comes down to, like, a, a very relatable level and is not just happily bub- happy bubbly and is, like, having a moment of, like, really thinking through something. And I like, think if that's what they really want. Um, and that kind of tone, you know, where it comes down a bit. Because most this is where I live naturally. But mm-hmm. if I can, like, really bring it down to, like, one of those levels or even deeper I'm very looking forward to an opportunity like that. I think probably my single favorite role of yours is Kaikoku and Ones Within. They're right. Kaikoku was a lot of fun. Uh, and Cliff cast me in, in the Ones Within. And that was like the first time I got to play a character very similar to that, which is like, you know, he's he's more like brooding and like he's kind of full of himself in some ways, but also he's like a team player. But I think the the visual image that I have like of him having like the umbrella just gave me like a certain kind of posture in the booth and I would always have the umbrella with me whether I was faking it or like uh well I guess I we recorded all that at the animation studio so yeah I always faked having an umbrella and most of the time that's what I do with my characters you know if they have a lamp or if they have something if they're holding something I will physically hold a fake object to get a feel of where that voice is within their body sort of similar related to what is the most uh, intensely like emotionally involved you had to get into for a role so far oh i would say gauma in yeah. sssss dina zenon his story is unlike any and because it was like a 12 episode character you know it's like i've had to like cry and do like angry things and bit parts and wall parts and things like that um but having a story from like the beginning into the end of a character's journey and seeing how the character transforms is huge and like seeing the progress that they make and like really exploring and delving into the relationships they have with these other characters and like what does that mean to me as galma you know that like i came i was treated really nicely by yomogi and then like all these other people started coming into my life and building a team together and like really learning to trust the team after like so long of being like, no, wrong, wrong, wrong. Finally, we come together and we do something awesome with Dinah Zenon. And then at the end to go through that journey of where does he end up? Mm -hmm. Uh, And what, what do other people think about him compared to when they first met him? And I feel like when we recorded the last couple episodes, especially, I was like, man, this is really sad. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and do you think that you have the most personal affinity with him, with characters you've played so far? Yeah. And I think it's because I think that he is, to me, someone that, like, I resonate with in a lot of, in a lot of ways, um, in that he's, he was... <laughs> When I was younger, I was kind of like I would like an out an outsider, you know, and like I would always try to find my way into groups of people to like introduce myself, even though it was kind of weird. And mm-hmm. he, you know, he's like that at the very beginning. And, and but when like people get to know him, it's like they have a really strong bond. And like when I found my group of friends in high school, it was like those were the people that I hung out with the rest of the time. And it was like, you know, I still call them. It's like nothing can separate us, even if like life does. Mm-hmm. It looks like uh, you got to be a couple different characters or and do inc- uh, incidental stuff in Black Clover. Yes, uh, Black Clover, I got to play uh, Gareth was like the first time that I worked with Chris George on that show. And Gareth is like is a mage, I think, from the Red Lion Kingdom, if, mm-hmm. that, if I'm remembering correctly. And then I, that was the first time I ever got to cast a spell was no. in that that episode that I, he cast me in and I was like I was like I've never got to cast an anime spell like what do I do and I had a ton of fun with him in that in that uh thing and like I learned kind of how to say a spell and like cast it and then uh later uh I was cast as a character called Onobi Shino I think his mm-hmm. name I know his first name is Onobi but he's part of the the Devil Banishers and finding like a different voice for him compared to Gareth was a lot of fun 
because you never know also in Black Clover when these people are going to show up again. It's like One Piece unless you read the manga and you know for sure like the characters are coming back. You just never know when these characters are going to reappear. And Gareth comes back like 200 episodes later or something like that. And it was just kind of bizarre. What is the case where you've had to alter your voice the most? Oh, I can't talk about it yet. Um, it's okay. coming out. It's coming. It's coming. But uh, yes, I've had a lot of fun working with one particular character. And I would say it's like the, it's the most I've ever had to alter my voice for something. Okay. It's soon. Soon. What was your experience uh, playing the paladin and the sleepy princess in Demon Castle? Oh, uh, paladin is just like he's he's a lot of fun. It's uh, that was part of like a, a bit session. So it's like whenever you get a bit session or a wall session, it's like you you look at the character design. You know, you don't have time to pre plan. They're just like they play you the the clip and they're like, all right, and let's go. And so. Um, it was just me. I just put me, you know, if I was a paladin in this situation, like what would I do? And that's how I say I would approach a majority of the character work that I do is like me in this situation. What is being said to me by the other character? How does that make me feel? And then how do I want to make them feel with what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. that is, that has helped me a lot in my, uh, in my journey so far. Do you have that same kind of approach with uh, red and banish from a hero's party? Yeah, so red is, it's, you, there's like a bunch of little different nuances between all these characters I play, you know, because Nakano is not red, and like red is not Galma, Galma is not Onobi, it's like, they all have like a very specific point of view on mm -hmm. their lives, and like about people around them, and like, Chris Waycamp has been really awesome to work with on Banished, and his... And, and Red's story, you know, like, even in the title, Banished from the Heroes Party, party decided to live a quiet life in the countryside. So it's, like, a guy who is just there to escape it all. And so, like, where do I find his voice? You know, it's, like, he's here, and he's ready, and it's, like, very down to earth. But then when something happens, you know, obviously he gets, he gets goes into, like, the battle mode. Or if, like, Rit, his love interest is involved in anything there's like a different way he talks to her mm -hmm. and there's different ways there's different kinds of versions of red depending on who he's talking to and when he is talking to them and of course another um, major dark role was uh, playing shigaraki's father ah uh, yes yes uh he was he was great uh colleen clinkenbeard is just a, a fantastic director as well because she finds a way to speak to to the actor, which like really resonates with them. And like, I, I, I love My Hero Academia, so I'm like a huge, a huge fan of the show. And so I did a lot of research prior to, uh, prior to the, the session. Um, and I went in and he is bad guy, but he is not bad guy. You know, it's like he has had like a, a whole series of problems in his life and the way that he can best think as a father to shelter, um, shelter a son, shelter Shigaraki is to just tell him no hero. There will be no heroes in this house because like I had a bad experience with it and I, I do not want that for you. And it's like a tough love kind of thing. You know, it, it makes it very fun and, and like very meaningful to like play characters like that because when villains or people that we perceive as bad do things they are not necessarily bad people some of the, like i would say it's like you have people that are obviously just like straight evil for being evil but if you can find a humanity within the people who are are bad or villains or uh just people like that if you find a humanity within those moments that is where the real like the connection comes between the actor and the character because if i played kotaro as just this this like horrible horrible f person it was just like evil there wouldn't really be any humanity between what was happening it's just like a, a bad guy doing things to his son but like yeah. because we know and they show in the anime like the way that he grew up and he shows remorse you know he's like i shouldn't have done that it's like this is the last thing that I wanted to do. So why am I doing it? And like, he regrets his action, but because he did what he did, you know, that's what, that's what pushes the story forward. And, uh, 
I, yeah, I really like characters like that where there's more to it than just evil guy or evil girl doing evil things. It's like there's there's a deeper humanity under there and there's a reason for why they do what they do. Mm. And regardless of how uh, dark or evil a character is that you play, do you always find something to personally relate to in them? Yes. So uh, taking taking Kotaro, for example, like the thing I took away from from like his story is like thinking as like a child, like how bad would it hurt me if I I loved my mother and like one day she just left. She just left and she said and you know and she never came back and like and she told you everything was going to be fine like that was the last thing she said to you and like just having a story and experience like that and thinking about what that would do to you growing up you know when kids at we're talking about their moms then like you just tell them it's like you know my mom just left one day and she never came back i don't know and then the like, getting in the mindset of like Oh, you start blaming that on other things. And like, I've done that in my life. You know, I'll blame, I'll blame some things on like, I have trash that I need to take out right now in my kitchen, but I'm not doing it. Why am I doing it? Because I'm busy, you know, and I'll make that excuse all day until there's not one, but two trash bags that have to be taken out. And I think once you find something to blame it on or deflect, deflect your, uh, yourself on, it becomes much easier as a character and as a human to deal with those things. Hmm. Moving on to another cool role uh, in uh, Mushoku Tensei. Oh, Almanfi the Radiant. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that, that was, the, that was the, the first time I'd worked with Jeremy Inman on a show. Uh, I hope he comes back because I, I haven't ever read the graphic or the light novel. And um, he's, he's a lot of fun because he's the first time I've played a character that's like very good with a sword and like really, really know. And it's like fast and like almost Dragon Ball Z levels of like, mm -hmm. and I was, when I was listening to the J the Japanese in my headphones that day, like it was like the guy, the say you who had done it is very like, it was, it was a little bit higher than my normal voice. And so like, when I hear that, I kind of associate that with a little more like regal and royalty Mm -hmm. Almost like he's too good um, to be doing what he's doing. And so having a point of view with a character like that, that's like, he's stronger than everybody there and he knows it. Uh, and making character decisions like that in the moment, I think, are what helps to bring characters like Almanfi to life. This is probably an obvious question too, but are you always getting um, physical in the booth, especially with like attack scenes and stuff? Yes. If you're, I, I, I'm an actor that feels like if you're not getting physical in the booth, that, uh, you're not truly living within the experience and the embodiment of the character, because y you can try to fake like a punch, but it's not going to have the same effect as if you really like follow through with a punch or like a kick to the gut. You know, if somebody, ki if somebody kicks you, if you don't do like a physical kind of reaction, then your torso isn't going to actually be doing the the action and so it's not going to sound as real it'll sound more like stuffled uh stifled more muffled so yeah i'm a big fan of being uh i always also i'm on my bare feet in the booth anytime i'm in my booth because i've uh a professor told me a long time ago that the best thing to do when you're on stage or like you're doing voiceover is like to be grounded and so when your feet are physically touching the earth or the the ground, whatever it is, you have a much uh, you have a much stronger core, and your and in your sense of your body is uh, it's it's able to do anything at a moment's notice. If you if you're wearing shoes or something like that, then there's like a layer between yourself and the earth. And I feel my most like comfortable and vulnerable when I when I have no socks or shoes on. It's just me and my feet in the booth. I'm like, I can feel the ground and I can really like connect with, with the earth in a weird way. This is a uh, back to a more realistic role with um, Tai Chi. Kageki Shoujo. Oh, right. Uh, I love, Mar <laughs> I love Marissa Lenti. She's, she's great. And uh, she's the one who directs Kageki Shoujo. And I got the audition for that. And I'm like, you know, if I was like a cool uncle, 
like where does where does tai chi live within my within my body so like a uh, being being loose for a character like that and listening to like my inner my inner uncle if you will in my head and being like tai chi's are just a really nice guy and he just wants the best for i and thinking like if i was i like what would i want to hear and like tai chi always knows what i wants to hear because he is he's a he's a good uncle and he listens and he's he's always been there for her ever since he was a child ever since she was a child and i think having again another kind of character that he he's i want to say he is probably the most like chill down to earth very very naturalistic character uh that i've ever played he doesn't have any like over the top moments that show is like very very realistic in a mm -hmm. in a lot of great ways and very naturalistic and he he has been different for me because of that and uh finding finding his voice was was very unique i think it's uh yeah one of the other big fantasy series that you did uh playing rio taro ari Furita. Oh, Ari Furetta. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, man. That's been, it's been a while since I recorded that one. I know season two is coming out, I think, in the spring. Uh, at least it was. I'm not, I'm not sure if they've delayed it at all. But Ari Furetta, uh, Mike McFarland cast me as, yeah, uh, Ryutaro Sagamaki, or Sakagami. One of those two. It's, his last name escapes me. But he's just a classmate that gets kind of pulled in to this into this world and he's like strong but that was the that was the first time i had to do a voice that was like very not similar to mine so he wanted him kind of like down here and more like hey let's go because he's like a bigger he's built bigger than like some other characters and like generally characters that have like big large chests will have like much deeper voices and like require more resonance mm -hmm. And uh, again, that was like the second time I got to cast this spell, which was a lot of fun. I, I remember very distinct moments throughout like my journey working in some of those booths with the directors. And I was like, it's the first time I get to do this or it's the first time I get to do this. And I have a ton of fun working with Mike. He's always great. And I was going to ask this early on, too, but uh, what uh, anime were you like personally a fan of growing up? Oh, man. There's so many. Uh, so my journey started with One Piece. I think a lot of people started with One Piece. Um, and I, it's like the one thing that, it's like the one thing that has like been a constant ever since I started watching it. I remember seeing the first few episodes and being like, this show is incredible. And like these characters are a lot of fun. And then I found out there was a manga and I was like, what is manga? So I started like delving into that. And like, you know, I'm all caught up with the current chapters on one piece and like, I'm caught up with the anime. And, uh, that was like a big, a big thing. It was like, one piece is such a cool show. I really think that show is awesome. And then I saw, uh, I, I started like reaching out to some of my friends, um, who I was like, Hey, I have watched one piece. Do you have any other recommendations? So I watched Akame Ga Kill, I watched Kill La Kill, I watched uh, Gurren Lagann, um, Death Note, then I started into things like Dead Man Wonderland, Hunter Hunter, and I have Attack on Titan, you know, I just started like kind of building all these things. Uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, I'm a big fan of JoJo. Uh, that, that would be like a dream show one day for me, would be JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. And um, just all kinds of stuff you know it's like once i started i really just kind of started sampling all kinds of things uh yeah it's it's been it's been interesting to learn to learn about like what kinds of animes i really enjoy and since you brought up aot i know you had a part in that too uh, what was your experience yeah uh so aot was has, has mostly been has mostly been like wall and background stuff but i did play carlo in the uh the, the most recent season and uh or the first part of the last season mm -hmm. and to to be a part of a show that is like so i think the animation is incredible and like the the team that works on it is incredible you know mike mcfarland and like bryce pavenbrook and like all the engineers that work on it like it's just it's just the most it feels like an epic you know it's like an epic story and being being even a small part of that has just been in, has just been awesome as a voice actor because 
I didn't I didn't realistically think that like I was I thought it was coming in too late to the game to make even be considered for a role in a show like that but being cast as a character that even appears for a few episodes is like so cool to me you know how however many times you've had to do it so far what's your uh like process for recording death scenes oh so death scenes are i i don't know that i've i mean i don't know which characters i've voiced have died i mean right. i assume a lot of them have died i know that there's a lot of like injuries that happen though mm -hmm. And that's that's where we go back to the physicality thing. It's like if somebody is like stabbing me with a sword, it's like it's not going to be like a, uh, you know, it's like a, uh, uh, like where do they stab me in the chest? Is it in the stomach? Where do I feel that within my body? And like, how does it hurt? Can I feel the tip going into my like spleen and out the other side? And like, if they do, they wiggle it around. So there's like tons of things that as the actor you come up with in your head. Um, and sometimes directors will be like, I need like less, or they'll say I need more. Mm -hmm. And that's just a, that's a directorial thing, you know, depending on how fast it's supposed to be. Like if a character gets like, it's like a quick, I don't know, like a quick arrow to the chest. It's not going to be like, ah! it's going to be like, a, <clears throat> or something. Yeah. So what is the uh, most recent, like safest thing that you can talk about that you're a part of? Um... I mean, I'm working on I'm working on Banished still. Uh, we're we're still we're still recording. We're recording like at a really really awesome pace, and everybody is working together so well. Um, Scarlet Nexus is still in the works as well. We're still we're still working on that. Um, I can't talk about like the thing I'm most excited about because like it's still it's still always still always away. Uh, but hopefully. Hopefully soon. I think everything that I've announced. Oh, uh, Heaven Officials Blessing. I've yep. recently uh, been cast in that, which has been awesome. And um, it's uh, it's Funimation's first Dong Hua dub, which I I didn't know that there that it was the first one ever that they had done. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what the recording process was going to be like for that versus like the standard anime. And it has been. It has been so interesting because I'm so used to in my headphones, you know, when we hear when we hear the the Japanese audio, I'm so used to hearing that. Mm -hmm. And when we heard the when we heard the uh, Heaven's official audio, it was like bizarre because I'm so used to all the different sounds coming from the Japanese seiyu. And to hear the the Chinese and Mandarin was like almost bizarre in a weird way because it's not sounds that like we're used to hearing. And so I would say after the first like episode or two, I got, I got really got used to it. Uh, but that first kind of couple of seconds is like, Oh man, I, I don't know that I can do this. Obviously it's the same, the same principle, you know, it's just, it's not Japanese. It's, it's Mandarin or Cantonese. And it's, it was, it's awesome. It's awesome to work on a show like that. And uh, usually my final question with interviews is asking, what do you want your legacy to be? Oh my God. That's such a, that's such a tough one. Um, because I feel like I'm in the very, very early stages of like starting, of starting to build like characters that I would like people to know me for. And I don't know that I've like hit the spot yet to where like, that is something that I've even really thought about, you know? Uh, because like, I feel like I'm building a base right now. I'm building a, like a very, a good base. And like, I want to keep like building until like I hit a character that people are like, Oh, I know him. He is known for this character. It's like, you know, I love, I love everybody in my hero academia. And like, I can look at like all these actors. I'm like, Oh, Cliff is known for Bakugo. And like, Justin is known for Midoriya. And it's like, it's like, it's just so, so exciting to like know that you are known for like a particular character. And I think a lot of the roles that I've played, like people be like, oh yeah, I've seen that show, but I don't know that it's necessarily one. Uh, Galma maybe maybe the one I think that like stands out that people would like be like, oh, I love that show. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think a lot of that comes from where, where like the things are posted and like, is, is it, broadcast on like a tsunami or is it broadcast on 
on Funimation exclusively or Crunchyroll and like what is the hype behind some of these characters and like I really think Galma is a character that like I've I've had a lot of fun working with and like if I were to like die right now like just like drop that I think he would be like the legacy role okay. um just because you know the show's done first off so it's not like it's not like I could I could finish the other shows I'm working on but I think that role in particular I did a lot of really good work on that show and like I listening to it again, I like watch every episode. And I'm like, I'm proud of like all of the work and like the collaboration that we all had as a team working on that show. And I think that would be that would be like my legacy. But what I want my legacy to be is like a bunch of roles. You know, I, I want people to be like, oh, he's in this show and this show and this show. What I think is what a lot of a lot of voice actors hope for one day is that it's not just like a one role thing. Um but having a role like Gamma was like a huge blessing, and I'm so so thankful to be able to to work in this industry. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. I'm happy that I got to be your uh, first interview. Yeah, thanks, man. This has been a lot of fun, and thanks for doing these. These are I was watching some of the ones you did earlier. This was a this is a lot of fun. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you're actually my uh, 101st. Oh, hey, let's go. <laughs> I'll be sure to uh, send it to you once I have it up too. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> Bye.